thank you to A Tribe Called Red for that incredible song. And welcome everyone to uh, the Indigenous Foods Week as part of the Culinary Breeding Network's Winter Vegetable Sagra. My name is Abba Kaiser, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Daniel Cornelius of the United Nation. And um, you can see his beautiful friends there with him as well, the beautiful corns he's brought today. Um, I am really thrilled to be introducing Dan and this work. Um, I am currently living out here in Sklala, Macaw and uh, Chimicum territory out on the Olympic Peninsula. And I work with Lane to help produce these tech events um, for the uh, Winter Vegetable Sagra that has been going on for several weeks. And uh, Lane unfortunately couldn't make it today, but it, it allows me to uh, do the honor of introducing Dan and his work. Um, so Dan Cornelius is a member of the United Nation and he works for the Intertribal Agriculture Council as well as having a part-time appointment with uh, UW Madison. And today he's going to be talking about a seed to table uh, indigenous food sovereignty today. This presentation will provide a short overview of the development of the indigenous food sovereignty movement through a demonstration on nixtamalizing indigenous hominy flint corn with stories and insights on seeds and nutrition. And uh, we're really thrilled to have Dan here today. Uh, Dan Cornelius wears a coat of many colors. He is a proud member of the United Nation and works as the technical assistance specialist with the Intertribal Agriculture Council for the Upper Midwest region. He is the general manager of the Mobile Farmers Market at Native Food Network. Additionally, he's also an outreach specialist for the Great Lakes Indigenous Law Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is co-teaching alongside Erwin Goldwyn, who, oh, sorry, Goldman, who recently appeared uh, on a previous Sagra here uh, during Garlic Week. Uh, and they work in the Horticulture Department on Indigenous Food and Seed Sovereignty. Dan also works on the development of producer cooperatives, supply chain analysis, and legal and policy aspects of food and agriculture. And if that wasn't enough, uh, Dan is also a rancher, a corn and pumpkin steward, and a wild rice advocate. So welcome, Dan. Um, can you hear us all right? Yep. Can you awesome. hear me? Yep. Everything's looking good and sounding good. And if, yeah, if you don't mind, we can get right into it. It looks like you've got some something on the stove there. Yeah, so I'm gonna actually um, come over and um, what we have going is um, have a calico flint corn here, just um, have that out for, uh, for mostly for display. I'm gonna cook a big pot of that later today. Um, but then I have a, another uh, pot here that I'm going to turn onto a boil and then um, I want to show you what that what that corn is. This is our um, Oneida or we would actually call this a, uh, a Tuscarora white corn and um, you can see the you can you can see there of, of what this corn looks like and this is this corn is is really part of why this is um, it's grown across really all of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, part of what makes this corn so special is that um, is, is that it, it, it's so it's it's so big that the ears are um, you know some of those are are twelve almost twelve inches long. Some other ones I've seen are fifteen almost up to eighteen almost up to 18 inches um, long. And um, it's a flower corn, which is nice because um, from, from my perspective, what's nice with the flower corn is that we can really use it for, for, almost, for almost anything. It is a little bit of a longer season corn. So I'm gonna talk a bit about that as, um, as we move forward. But, um, in the meantime, I'm just gonna let I'm gonna let the uh, the stove go. I'm gonna go back over there just in a in a few minutes and um, and show the uh, the the next step of nixtamalizing corn. Our first step is we've been soaking that corn for a little bit, and then um, 
And I'm going to just let it go for, for a few minutes longer. And then we're going to go back and I'm going to show you some pretty cool stuff with that. But um, in the meantime, I want to give just a basic overview of, um, of really ask, well, first introducing myself in a little bit more detail and then talking about, about food sovereignty. Um, today, coming uh, to you from Southern Wisconsin, um, my farm, Yewela D, is just south of, um, of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Day Jope. I'm on Ho Chunk territory here, um, a couple hours south of, um, of the, the Oneida Reservation in Wisconsin. But um, this, is, uh, this is my home. This is my, this is my kitchen um, that i uh, doing the, the demo and the presentation uh, today from. And just to kind of show of, of where and we get, you know, uh, the land acknowledgements have become uh, the new, the new big thing. And I um, wanted to go into a little bit more detail of that, this land where I'm at. I'm um, right at the, uh, right north of the confluence of the Ahara and the Rock Rivers. And this area of Dejope was historically a, a major settlement area. Um, the highest concentration of effigy mounds anywhere in the world. This is this is the capital of Wisconsin today, but this has been a capital city for a, for a very long time. Um, really nice area here where we can grow. We've got pretty long growing seasons, um, but this is just my um, my first year on the farm. I, I bought it last summer, and I was fortunate that the previous owners had had let me get some plantings in, and um, but, uh, but that's where I'm coming today from. And just the Awela D that translates into a, a warm wind or a gentle wind in Oneida. The farm um, was previously, it was Zephyr farm. Zephyr is Greek for a, for a warm west wind. And um, I wanted something a little bit more of, um, you know, speaking to, to my background and, and to the work that, um, that I do and that, that, that's happening here. It's, this is really turning the farm into a, into a seed sanctuary. And, um, and that's a big part of my work is growing out seeds. Uh, one of my friends, Biscockin and Greg Johnson from Lock to Flambeau, Greg was down the first night that, that I moved in and Greg woke up in the morning and he heard the, the cranes. And so he had named the, um, the land here, Basweiwe Gediganing, which translates to Echo Maker Gardens. But, um, you know, start, part of starting off with some of this background and story is, um, you know, it was just really how, you know, how I look at the land and I think how most indigenous people look at the land, um, you know, that, that it's, it's a place and, um, and there's so much that we can learn from what the land is, is saying. But uh, I want to ask, you know, start then by, by asking this question of, of what is food sovereignty? And I'm going to be going to be really covering the theme throughout the presentation. I'm just going to turn down this um, this burner a, a little bit and come back to that in just a minute. But uh, asking the, the question, what is what is food sovereignty? This picture here, this is from Standing Rock, uh, the Backwater Bridge night back in 2000, um, 2016, and you know, this struggle over protecting the water. You know, it's 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 come back to the forefront of these pipelines, um, you know, today, and um, you know, there's been leaks on these pipelines. But really, this question of food sovereignty, it's it's directly, you know, it's, it's what people were there at Standing Rock about. It's protecting the water. It's protecting the land. It's protecting our ability for the land to be able to to sustain us. And I think it's important to recognize that historically, this continent that we're on, Turtle Island, that we had extensive trade networks, we had advanced agricultural systems, and a lot of that knowledge has really been um, has been diminished and uh, and intentionally diminished and um, and hidden really over the years. But I think part of the exciting thing today is just looking at. Um, you know, looking at some of the indigenous production systems and how pro how productive they were. This picture here, this is Cahokia. This is the confluence of the Missouri, the Mississippi rivers. So I'm at the confluence of the Rock and the Ahara rivers. Our, our waterways were really the um, you know, the equivalent of the interstate highway system um, combined with the railroads back in the day. That's how good, you know, how larger uh, amounts of goods were moved. And it's how one of the main ways that people traveled historically. So there's, it's not a coincidence that Cahokia was located 
where it was. And it wasn't a coincidence that Dejop was um, was such a, a, a center of human settlement because the resources that the land provided were substantial at Dejop. And uh, similarly at Akahokia of that confluence of those rivers, you know, it, it made sense for people to, to locate there. And really thinking about the, you know, the land and the resources, that is so much at the core of what food sovereignty is and of the, the struggle of, um, of, you know, to, to really to bring that food sovereignty back today. But want to want to go back and just and think about what, what did, what was that historic food system? What did it look like uh, here where I am? Where did it, what did it look like across the, across Turtle Island? A picture here of, uh, um, a uh, ho-chunk uh, uh, corn harvest and husking the corn. Here's a picture of drying how many corn. So, um, well, actually this probably would have been just not necessarily how many, but ho-chunk prepare corn a little bit of a different way, but this is drying processed corn. And this show a picture of, um, of the process here. This is, um, this is some finished corn of a white corn. And um, Dan, up. I hate to interrupt you, but um, the the camera is on the stove at this point because that's the. Um, so I'm going to come over to the, come over to the stove here. Yes. And you can see a little bit. You can see a little bit better. But got a white corn, got a, a blue corn. This is those are dried. Those are dried hominy corns. So this process that we're going through today ultimately will be ending up either that or 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 we'll end up just eating some of it. But. Uh, but here's a picture of uh, of whole chunk of drying corn, and then uh, drying squash. I've got some um, some fire roasted dried pumpkin back here, and um, you know this is um, this um, you know this this dried uh, dried squash dried pumpkin. This would have been one of the main ways that food was preserved was, was drying it historically. And today you go to a, a grocery store and you're probably not gonna not gonna find any dried squash or, or dried pumpkin. But historically, without um, you know the today's modern refrigerators um, and freezers and mason jars, drying would have been one of the main ways that food was preserved. A uh, picture of um, of whole chunks harvesting um, cranberries and the cranberry bogs, and then the seeds and the tools, and really thinking about. You know what does um, what what is the story within each one of these seeds? So what's the story behind these tools? How are they used? What what were those production systems? Um, you know, to me, that's one of the most fascinating um, questions. And uh, one of uh, um, a scholar that that I have uh, uh, a ton of respect for, Jane Mount Pleasant. Um, Jane had. Uh, Jane argues that indigenous production systems in the 16th and 17th centuries were five times more productive as European farming systems of that era. So per acre, five times as much grain coming off of these fields in Turtle Island versus Europe at that time. And, um, you know, whether, whether that number is exactly accurate or not, I think that, um, I, I tend to think it probably is, but I think that that just that question of, um, you know, undoubtedly we know that that these production systems were highly were highly productive. And what were really what what were they, and and why were they so productive? Those are some of the big questions that I you know that I'm working on today with my own growing and trying to get back to more of of those systems. But um, but thinking about food sovereignty. Um, and it could go on for uh, for a whole course on on the idea of a doctrine of discovery and um, and part of why we talk about food sovereignty today and the the link between food and sovereignty. Well, in the um, in the late 1400s, the papacy, the Catholic Church had um, had had issued a series of papal bulls and established this idea of the doctrine of discovery, which is that if a European nation uh, discovers and, and, and charts explores territory that um, or land that 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 land becomes their territory. It's a little bit more complex than that, but this is the foundation of um, of, of United States federal Indian law today, and this is what really had fueled um, 
the era of colonization and this, this notion, this idea of the Colombian exchange. And you can see here just a glimpse of what that exchange looked like. If we had all of these, um, of these foods and resources, you don't see gold and, and some of the other minerals on there. Um, you do see going the other way of some of the, the animals and some of the plants or some of the, of the diseases. I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail today, but um, yeah, I think that you know, I've lost quite a few close friends in the past year and um, COVID is hitting our tribal communities a lot harder than, it, than it's hitting um, the rest of the country and, and much of the rest of the world. And a lot of those disparities, the reasons why it's hitting harder, come back to uh, uh, this history of, um, of the development of federal Indian law. And um, I'm just gonna add a little bit more water to the pot here. Uh, come back to the history of, uh, of the development of federal Indian law. And it is really a legacy of, uh, of these policies, but it, it, does, it does give me pause and to think of it, it's really bad right now what would it have been like if you if you lost a third or half or ninety percent of your community, and that was the reality that um, you know of one of the impacts of colonization that I think is important to to recognize and the impact of um, of what did that have across the landscape and what impact did native production have on development of the landscapes development of the soils that we have today. I think those are some. Um, are some are some big and important questions to be uh, to be thinking about, and I'm not going to go into a ton of depth today, but um, but do you know, really encourage people to be to be thinking about that, and we'll have a few more insights as we go. Um, so, you know, right there, I'm actually going to um, I'm gonna gonna take a pause, and we're gonna we're gonna go over to the stove here because I wanna show you what this, uh, what this process of nixtamalizing corn is. And um, so once, um, and when I do this, I'm actually gonna just stop sharing the screen for a sec, because I think it'll be easier to see the stove top here. Um, but uh, you can see here, so this is our, this is our, this is our white corn came out of, um, of this jar right there, and you can see just those beautiful, um, those beautiful kernels. Uh, Onust is, is Oneida for um, for corn. And, you know those glimmering kernels shining back. And so the first thing that um, that I did was I soaked the corn, boiling it in a little bit of uh, of water, and so it soaked up that all that water. And now this is the key component of nixtamalization. I'm going to take a, a hardwood ash. This is right out of my, my wood burning stove. This here is, um, this, is uh, this is ash tree of uh, mostly black, white, uh, and, some, and some green ash. Unfortunately, we've got the emerald ash borer that's coming through and has decimated these trees. Uh, ideally, I'd probably be using maple, uh, I think more a little bit more minerals in maple, but so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, going to sift some of this corn. And what I want you to notice is how the corn changes color, and it's going to happen fairly quickly. I'm going to add just a little bit more here. And I'm going to stir it in. And you can notice uh, just how quickly this corn turns to that really deep sunset orange, and it'll keep on, it'll keep on, on getting a little bit darker there. This is um, this is this is the basic process of nixtamalization or or hulling corn, and you can see it keeps on on deepening. And so we've got a chemical reaction that's happening there that's breaking down that outer hull. So we call this hulling corn. And in the process, it is adding, um, it's adding calcium, and it's, but it's really making the corn easier for our bodies to digest. And in, um, in, in that process, it's, um, 
It's making uh, niacin more bio bioavailable and making vitamins uh, more bioavailable as well. And so that picture that I had showed of of the Vatican, and this is part of the part of our, our seed stories. And we'll come back to this corn in in a little bit. Um, but one of the themes that I want people to be thinking about today is that you know these seeds these seeds are are not. Um, they can't be understood in isolation. There's a whole set of knowledge that goes along with how to prepare them, how to how to take care of them, how to steward them, and so that's something one to, to think about. And that that one of the challenges of when those seeds went over to in, in, to Europe as part of this Colombian exchange, not all of that knowledge went with them, and so. I've been over to, uh, I took that picture of the Vatican actually when I was going over to a slow food Terra Madre event in Italy. And, and we're over there and we're hearing the Italian, um, you know, experts on corn talking about polenta. I don't think they have any idea of nixtamalizing corn. And so, and, and 500, four or 500 years ago when that corn went over and, and when polenta really became associated with Italian food, that knowledge on how to nixtamalize the corn didn't go. And so you start having uh, increase of pellagra, of, a, of a niacin deficiency. So, you know, so that's part of what I wanted to share today and really thinking about that, that impact of, um, it's not just, the, not just the seeds, but it's all of the rest of the knowledge that goes along with it. Um, now continuing on our journey, on our, on our quick journey here through, um, through food sovereignty, uh, Picture up in the, the corner there, Andrew Jackson. Um, that picture was hanging in the Oval Office till very recently. And uh, Andrew Jackson was an Indian fighter and presided over the beginning of the Indian removal era. And this was not just for the for the five tribes in the Southeast. This was for most of the tribes across uh, all the Eastern United States were subject to removal, but tribes across most of the country were subject to some sort of, uh, of a removal. and um, in, in being put onto to reservations. And you can see here some of, uh, of, of the impact of those land sessions. And you can see here of looking at food sovereignty, looking at this, this struggle over control of the resources and control over the food. If you can control the food, you can control the people. And you see the giant pile of buffalo skulls there is a very vivid illustration of, um, of, uh, of eroding that sovereignty and controlling that food and the impact that it that it had. Um, but um, but looking at uh, within the Great Lakes region where I'm at of some of the first European explorers that came in on the on the big uh, on the big canoes and what they saw was they saw these amazing braids of, uh, of, of corn and they saw uh, corn was really one of the, the staple foods that fed large numbers of people in conjunction with the fish, with wild rice, with the, with the corn, the beans, the squash, every, everything else. Um, and you can see here just to add one of, those, one of those very first Europeans that came into uh, to the Great Lakes uh, at Alloway and what he saw at present day uh, Red Cliff, Bad River areas. But uh, the Oneida white corn, you saw the, the glimpse there of, of, of what it turns to when we're, when we're nixtamalizing it. And uh, this is a depiction of, of our longhouse. And so you can see the, the braids of corn hanging down from, from the rafters. Um, so much that we could go into a bunch more detail just on the longhouse and, and everything that can be learned from just um, how these were constructed. Uh, Elmbark was, was, was what was used. But um, for, uh, for our quick journey through uh, looking at Oneida food sovereignty, uh, Oneidas, we saved George Washington's army uh, on the Delaware by bringing corn down and feeding them and showing them how to how to cook that corn. And uh, the Revolutionary War had split the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, of which Oneidas are 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 a member. And Oneidas sided with the with the Americans. Most of the rest of the of the Confederacy sided with the British. And um, in consequence, Washington sent out General Sullivan and Sullivan's expedition in 1779 spent several weeks moving through Haudenosaunee territory and burning, chopping down the fields, burning those fields and burning the villages. And so you can see here some of what, you know, just the extent of that, of, of that food system historically and how food was used as a, as a tool of control. 
uh, for the Revolutionary War and beyond. Uh, moving forward, uh, Oneidas, we came to, um, to Wisconsin starting in 1822. And this, uh, this is, is fast forwarding past the, the General Allotment Act that divided the reservation. And there's a trust period that was put in place. This was my great, great grandfather. And he talks about in 1909 about the impact of lifting that allotment, that restriction on selling that land. Well, unfortunately it was lifted and 99% of the reservation was lost. But you know, part of what I, what I want to, you know, to think about, so that was my, my great, great grandfather this is four generations of my family, of my grandpa, my dad, myself, and my son. So then going back to my grandpa's, my grandpa's dad, and then to, to his grandpa, that's, you know, right there, that's six generations. So my son would be, his, his uh, children would be that seventh generation. So thinking about just that difference of, of, of what had happened over the course of those seven generations is, um, it's pretty remarkable. And I see a lot of opportunity moving forward, but you know, just glimpsing through the Great Lakes region, a similar story with um, with maple syrup and going from 450,000 pounds of Michigan tribes selling in 1865 to um, uh, losing those forests with clear cutting, and you know, so really thinking, of what's that impact when when your entire your entire forest is is lost? What's the impact on the food? Um, and then with the boarding schools and the impact of when, you know, you can't speak your language, you're taken away from your family. All of this is part of the demise of our food systems. But part of the exciting thing is looking at how they've come back. And, I, and I've got the, the picture of uh, this was from my corn planter that I, my four row that I bought and found this seed in there. And, you know, and what does this one seed say of coated in the, in the, um, in the, in the fungicide? And, uh, you know other organisms that have been uh, that have been bred into it, and it's great for yields. But in terms of flavor, taste, not quite so much. But what can we what can we learn from from some of our other uh, from some of our other corns? And this right here, why I'm uh, why I'm sharing a picture of this corn and want and want to show of um, from from that first uh little four braids that i had gotten from steve, an elder steve mccumber uh then growing out uh that corn so the quick story with this is i was talking to steve mccumber and and um uh, and steve had uh i asked steve what do you think about me crossing the the white corn with this manitoba white I said, why would you want to do that well because we need more short season corns well how many rows so that's about a 10 to 12 row. No, don't do that. Our corn is eight rows. And so at the end of that, that Honeshwini Seed Keepers meeting, Steve came, he gave me this corn and said, this is what you want to grow. Uh, so a group from that, from that, I've grown this out for the past several years and we've gotten it out to, to many other tribes in the region because just as recently as five, six years ago, almost everyone was growing that Oneida Tuscarora white corn, and that's 115, 120 day corn. It's not gonna do the best in a, in a short season area. So bringing those seeds back, but really over the past few years, we've just had a, such, a, um, such a, a, a positive explosion of the seeds being coming back to our communities. And this is a, pick, this is a red lake corn here. Um, and Jack DeJarle, the grower of, of this has been passed down in his family. And Jack, we were at a Red Lake Food Summit. Jack was showing how to how he nixtamalized his corn, and he saw he saw some of uh, of this hagoa and and asked if he could have some. And I I gave him some, and he came back and gave me a handful of this Red Lake corn. And uh, but all of these corns, they're coming back. They're coming back to our communities, and I think it's one of the most exciting things of 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 bringing our food systems back and asserting our sovereignty through growing food again and feeding our communities. So as I move toward wrapping up here, I, I want to talk about one of the efforts that we have at um, University of um, at the University of, of Wisconsin. And I'm going to just, um, well, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to bring these over to the stove quickly so that people can see, but I've got um, three different, uh, three different corns that I want to, that I want to show. So we've got uh, a Bear Island Flint corn right there. We've got a Turtle Mountain white, and then we have a, um, a the Red Lake Flint corn. And we grew all 
five uh, of these three plus two other Bear Islands last last uh, summer at the UW Indigenous Research Garden as part of the Arboretum. And um, one of those Bear Islands finished in 70 days. The, the, another one finished in 115, 120 days. So, you know, you just see that difference right there. It's, um, it's just absolutely remarkable. And then the, the 70 day seeds are going out to our, our community members this year. And that's part of that rematriation. The Turtle Mountain White that I showed, uh, that Turtle Mountain White was not at uh, Turtle Mountain anymore. And we're bringing it back up this spring and they're gonna be growing it out as well. Um, one other quick note I wanted to mention, uh, I think part of the power of collective action the Native Farm Bill Coalition uh, had come together for the 2018 Farm Bill had resulted in a record number of 63 tribally oriented provisions. And so part of what I wanted to share it on uh, here is that with the seeds, with our food systems, how can we collectively be coming together and really advocating for the policy changes that we wanna see and for the future that we wanna see with our food system. And I think with the, on the tribal side, that this is a great uh, a great story here and um with that i'm going to wrap it up and open it up for uh, for some questions and in the meantime i'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to the stove top and just quick say then so um we would let this i'm gonna add a bit more water we'll let this corn cook for about an hour or so kind of depends a little bit on the on the ash and then We'll rinse this corn and try to rub the rub those hulls off. I'll use some wire baskets to rinse it, and then boil it again in clean water, and then uh, and either then dry it or eat it, freeze it. Um, and of course, there's some different ways of um, of maximizing corn. Some people will let it sit overnight, but this is typically the way that I'll do it: is is boiling it like that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. Amazing to see that transformation happen so quickly on the stovetop. And thank you for sharing that little bit of the history. I know it's just a really painful history as well to, um, to live with and to share. So I appreciate you taking the emotional energy that it takes to share that with us. So um, we have a few questions in the chat on YouTube. And if folks want to post their questions now, they are able to. Um, the first one for you is, do you have a sentimental tool of your own? I think this question came up when you were showing the slide of the, um, the, the tools that had been used traditionally. Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, just one, se one second, mm -hmm. My planting stick downstairs. Great. Uh, so some tools, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm going to show one in a second, but, um, you know, just, a. A couple that I want to show here. This is um, this is this was my great uh, this was my great grandma's um, cooking uh, corn paddle, and then this is uh, this is a, a cooking paddle that that I have made more recently, and um, making a bunch more of these in the next few weeks and, and getting them out. And one of our things we host intertribal food summits, and we've had a big focus on uh, on the tools. And, you know, for me, I don't plant everything with a planting stick, but really understanding, understanding, um, you know, what the, what the planting sticks are and, and how you use them is, I think it helps to deepen that relationship with the, with the foods. So um, here's one that I, that I've been using, you know, out in the field. Here's one that I've, um, I've just have done kind of a rough blank, did a little bit of work on it, and I'm sending that to one of our other seed keepers. Um, so, you know, I think these planting sticks to me are one of those tools that are just, um, I use it for all different types of stuff. But back to that question that I was asking of, um, you know, what, what were our historic food systems? How were, how were those foods produced? Understanding some of these tools, I think, is uh, is really an important part of rebuilding those relationships to the foods and, and really understanding our responsibilities to them. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah, I saw the Haudenosaunee uh, planting stick in your in the video um, that I think it was on like a Wisconsin 
uh, Eat Wisconsin website or something, but I'll, I'll make sure to post that in the chat for folks if they want to see that in action in the field. Um, we have another question here. Hominy versus dried corn. One is already nixtamalized, question mark. Yeah, so, um, you know, so again, I'm just going to show, um, I'm just going to show, um, you know, the, the dried. So the, this is, this is how many corn that was, that was finished, it was cooked and then, and then dehydrated. So when we, you know, when we do that, then we don't need to go through, um, we don't need to go through that, that whole process of, um, of, um, uh, you know, that, that takes, you know, four or five hours, then we can just drop it into water and, and boil it, or we could grind that to make more of like a masa of flour. Great. Beautiful. Yeah. And you're, so the camera is back on, um, at the table now, I think it was just when you were sharing your screen, it only allowed one other video. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You're good. Um, and another question, um, do, does each corn have specific uses? Yes, that is a, that's another, um, another great, uh, another great question back way over there. I've got, um, I've got some other flower corns, but yeah, different corns have, have, um, have different, have different uses and, you know, and you see that historically and that's part of bringing back the corn, more of the corns today is, um, is, is that they've got different flavors and just the difference between a, a flint and a, and a flower corn is, is huge. And you can really see it with this, um, with this turtle, uh, with this, with this turtle mountain corn. Um, and um, I'm going to go actually go over to my phone. It's got a little bit better camera on it, but you can see, so um, you can see right here that some of them, it's kind of bright there, but you've got, you see some that are really like solid and then some that are more translucent. That's the difference between the flower corn is going to be more solid versus the flint corn is going to be more translucent. So the flower corn is going to be softer. It's going to be easier to, it's going to be easier to grind versus the flint corn. It's going to be, it's going to be harder. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's better for, for how many, you can grind both of them to a, to a flower, but, you know, especially if you're using something like a, a corn mortar, um, it's going to be a lot easier to grind a, 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 a flower corn. And then also, um, you know, and then we, of course we've got sweet corns. I don't have a, a braid of sweet corn with me today, but, um, I've got, um, yeah, I, I, there's a couple of different sweet corns that I grow as well. And all these corns will eat them uh, at like green or a sweet corn stage, uh, generally as well. But, um, but yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, in each of the corns, they've got, a, you know, really a, a different, a different flavor and different use. Great. Thank you. Um, we got another question from the same person who asks, this is Patrick Mercer, um, asks, does nixtamalization come up in origin stories? You don't have to share specifics, just curious. That's a, that is actually a, a really good question. And I'm sure, I'm sure that it does for some, for some different tribes. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware of it though with, um, with, Oneida, but, um, but that's a good question. And I, I think, a, another just good question and start one, an area where I'm, um, interested in working and doing some more, uh, research is just looking at the differences in nutrition and, um, of just starting with different types of wood ash. And I mentioned that I'm using ash, you know, from ash tree right now, but, um, Ideally, I would use maple because I think maple have a little bit more of minerals and nutrients in there. But what's the difference between ash, oak, maple, you know, the, the different woods, but then, um, you know, of, of cow or baking soda or lime. I mean, there's, um, there's different, um, there's different lies that can be used. And so I think that just that right there of, on a nutritional side is is a pretty interesting question but then 
how each of them function when you, when you're um, when you're cooking the corn is you know is different and and I'll notice between even just different types of um, of different ash that I've used over the years that some are going to be quite a bit stronger than uh, than others. So back to the question, I know that there that there are that there are stories um, you know especially going going down into uh, Mexico and Central America that that there's a that this technology, this history goes back thousands of years. So I'm, I'm more just presenting on it from a, um, from more of a, of a North American Honeshoni perspective. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, we have another, a few other questions here. Um, what is your most nostalgic or sentimental corn dish? Oh, corn soup for sure. Cause that's what my grandma, that's what my grandma, um, you know, would always, would always cook and, um, and, and bring down for, you know, for the holidays. And, and she just, she knew I liked corn soup. So, so she would make corn soup. And um, that for me is definitely would be the most, the, the, the most nostalgic because of that connection with, um, you know, just with my family history. Mm -hmm. Do you still make that soup? Do you try it? Do you try to? Oh yeah. That today? Mm -hmm. Yep made it uh, I mean this past year was a little bit was a little bit rough because um COVID but typically I'll make that for my for my grandpa every my grandpa still is alive 99 um and so I make make that for my grandpa in the holidays and you know and other times too I'll just bring him up some um bring him up some soup and um this year made it for you know, just for my my parents and brother and um uh, I had smoked a turkey for, for Thanksgiving. So then I, I made stock out of that turkey and, and, and uh, had made it that way. Delicious. Uh, and then a follow-up question to that. Did you make it with the Oneida white corn? Um, no, I used some blue corn this year for, for that one, but yeah, typically, I, typically I do, but it just kind of depends of, you know, what I got, what I got available and, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they, you know, different corns, you know, they do have a, a different flavor. That's for sure. And I'm wondering, we were talking a little bit before the session about, um, even just the term breeding. And I know, um, that you mentioned that's not really something that is really in the lexicon and the work that you're involved with. I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, this, this concept of plant breeding, I think is kind of, um, it's not the most favorable term for most of the tribal community members that I work with. And I, I think that a lot of that, it, um, you know, it comes to, um, it comes to some of the stories of our seeds and to the history of, of our, um, of our, uh, of our seeds. And, um, and more of, uh, there's more of an intention and in, in a desire to maintain these, uh, these lines, I think is, is, is part of it, but I think it's, it's got a deeper, um, there's some deeper issues too, of that picture I showed of, uh, you know, of that, of that, of that transgenic field corn of, you know, people kind of associate and they look at, you know, at the Western goals of just maximizing yields and not really looking at flavor, not really looking at all of the other uses for the corn. And so plant breeding has an association with all of that. But at the same time, we select corn. I mean, there's a, a plant breeding component to just maintaining each of these, of these lines. And part of, you know, part of why we have such amazing um, amazing lines of corn is, is because of, of that deliberate selection over, over the years. So you know, I think it's, it's a little bit more complicated, um, you know, nuanced when you get into the details on it, but yeah, it's, that's definitely, um, that's, uh, it's definitely a complex topic with, with a lot of our community members. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering, uh, this might be a really complicated question and you can tell me if I need to whittle this down a little bit, but for myself personally, I'm really interested in how the local food movement 
kind of intersects with the um, indigenous seed sovereignty movement and kind of where you see those conversations interacting and where you see them kind of being in, in discord or um, there needing to be some kind of more conversation around um, how these how these kind of two movements work together. Yeah, that's a, a good question that I think that the answer on that is is going to kind of vary based on um, on who you, you know, on, on who you talk to different people, I think, have different have different thoughts on it. Different communities have different thoughts. And part of sharing some of that history, you know, I was, I was going through some of those, you know, through it fair, fairly quickly. But I did ask, I mean, what's the impact of losing you know, losing your forest. Mm -hmm. One impact is going to be you're going to lose a lot of your of your of your food supply if if you you know in the case of maple of, of sugar, and um, but I think a fairly universal um, reality was that as you know as the, as as food systems were attacked and and um, and really tribal indigenous food systems. Um, had diminished in, um, in in their production capacity and just overall supply. The the relationship with with those foods changes. Whereas in the case of the Michigan tribes in 1865 of selling 450 thousand pounds of sugar, um, when the forests are clear cut and you only have just enough for ceremony or for your family. Well, then it kind of becomes taboo to, to think about selling, you know, of, of that food. And we see it with, you know, with corn and, and with a lot of our, of our foods of where we're just at a point of, of having enough supply to be feeding our family or our community, that, that that's the focus. And, and most, a lot of growers I work with and producers, they're not as interested of just selling to the highest bidder that, they're just trying to feed the family first. And then from there, maybe uh, a lot of people might, who aren't as, um, as open to selling food would be more okay with trading. So that's one of the cool things is we're seeing more of the trade and the barter coming, coming back. And, you know, and I think it, you know, a lot of it just is the respect for, uh, for, for the foods, but then, I mean, I work for the Intertribal Agriculture Council and one of our main objectives is helping producers and helping, you know tribal communities make a living from the land mm -hmm. you know and and so i think that there's definitely a huge economic piece there as well and that's where i think it really comes down to each community and producer of whether they feel it's appropriate to be you know to be selling foods and who they feel it's appropriate to be selling to but the intersection of tribal food sovereignty and um and um, in, in the broader food movement, I, there's some challenges there of, um, I know that people, a lot of growers probably would love to have these seeds. I've got people asking me all the time for Ho-Chunk seeds. And um, you know, my first, my general response is that, well, you should go and ask Ho-Chunk if, if you can have some and if they feel that that's appropriate. But um, you know, if a lot of people's motivation is, oh, well, I could, you know, I could sell that. And, you know, granted, there's a lot of demand for the for these corns right now, but it's just kind of in a lot of ways, it's just one more continuation of, of this whole history of um of extraction. We should turn this banner off of um of of extracting resources and and you know and, and profiting off of those those resources. So there's a pretty strong uh, hesitancy towards sharing. Uh, the seeds and even, you know, and, and even in a lot of instances of, um, of sharing the knowledge and in the stories. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's, that's, a, I think, a, an open question. But I, at the same time, I think there's a lot of opportunity for partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Rowan White had coordinated a big, um, a big seed drive last year, and had, um, had sent out thousands of seed packets to tribal um, to tribal community members, and especially at a time where a lot of seed companies were running out of seeds, that was it was really huge and important for 
for people to uh, to get connected, not just with indigenous seeds, but you know other you know just regular vegetable crops for their for their gardens. So I think that's an area where there's a lot of opportunity for partnership and where um, where there's kind of some some opportunities for for mutual support. But it comes back to that idea of of partnership, and partnership is really a you know is a is a is a is a two way street or multiple way street depending on how many partners are are there. So I think there's opportunity there. I think that there's also opportunity. I mean, when I'm working with with tribal growers and communities. One of the first things I'll recommend, go connect with your local farmers because maybe you need a bigger tractor for a couple of different tasks, a couple of hours, a few hours a year. Do you need that equipment all the time? Can you have a neighbor come and, you know, and, and help you with that? Um, that, that that's just a, a pretty basic thing of, I think, wherever you are of, um, of trying to work with your neighbors and having some of those good, um, some of those good relationships. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for, for partnership and don't by any um, means want to, uh, to scare people away from, from thinking about those partnerships. And, you know, but first thing is just building the relationships, I think with, um, you know, wherever you are, who you might be working with, of just, you know, starting with the relationships and then going from there of building more of, um, of enhanced partnerships. Great. Thank you so much for that answer. There's um, a quote that I really like is moving at the speed of trust and really focusing on who you're around and building that trust over time, that long work um, in order to really get clear on how how to best move forward. And um, it's not always gonna be uh, what you think necessarily. Um, and uh, yeah, just lots of comments here in the YouTube chat, just saying, thank you so much. Thank you for your integrity. Um, and one question from Kamala Hayes, uh, are you concerned about this corn becoming co-opted and God forbid trendy and or gentrified? Well, yeah, I mean, that kind of, Kind of goes back to um you know to some of, of what i just was you know my last response there mm -hmm. yeah I, I i i do but um i also i mean i think this is one of the debates within indigenous you know native food sovereignty movement is um in this whole idea of cultural appropriation personally i want to see um i want to first see feeding our communities more. And there's a, um, you know, back to the native um, farm bill coalition and, and the power and the opportunity with, with policy change. Right now, there is a, a request for proposals that USDA has open for tribal food distribution offices to be able to buy directly instead of having to, to get the food from USDA and through this, this extensive, um, you know, and and complex federal procurement process, giving the tribes the ability to be able to buy directly. And I think the power that that's gonna have in encouraging more local production down the line is huge and where we can get past some of these, um, you know, some of these economic issues um, and really cultural issues. I think people are generally, our growers and our tribes are generally more open to, um, to selling food if it stays within at least intertribal communities. And so that's a power right there with, um, with a change in, in policy and hopefully that continues to expand. But um, I, I also, I wanna see more of our foods in top restaurants in Chicago and you know, New York and, and Portland and, and wherever. I'd like to see more of native entrepreneurs owning those, those businesses and those restaurants. But I think that, um, I, you know, I, I think that we also need to be looking at, from an economic standpoint, how do we support bringing more dollars back to our, our communities and for, for growers, for producers who, who want to sell outside the community and who have that surplus. Uh, I think we need, really need to be looking at that as well. And, you know, just one other quick uh, 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 tidbit of information. If you look at the, 
uh, USDA has the, the national, um, the, ag, uh, the ag census. And within the ag census of, of comparing, just comparing two of the, of the groups there of Asian American farmers, ranchers versus Native American farmers, ranchers, there's one third the number of Asian American farmers and ranchers on one thirtieth the amount of land, yet they're doing almost double the annual sales. So that's an indicator that most of our, of our, of our Indian ag, of our tribal agriculture, it's commodity production, it's commodity based, it's, it's calves that are going off to a livestock auction and ultimately going to a feedlot, getting pumped full of a bunch of the GMO corn and coming back as, um, you know, as, as hamburger. And I'd like to see a system where more of that product is just staying right within our communities but that we're getting more value to our producers that ultimately is then support more sustainable economic development throughout our communities. So that's a lot of the work that um, the Intertribal Ag Council and our partners are focused on how do we support that? How do we build more infrastructure to encourage that to make it easier for our producers who want to capture more value throughout that value chain to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I know you have to go uh, in a few minutes here, but I just um, wanted to put two questions out. One is the last question is, um, what are you most excited about in the food sovereignty movement in the next five to 10 years? And then also, how can um, other folks tuning in today support your work or um, uh, help move the needle forward a little bit? Um, well, I think in, in terms of supporting the work, if, if we have any, um, you know, any growers out there, any seed companies out there that are, um, you know, that have some extra seed, you know, either contact myself or contact Rowan White. I know we're, we're looking to, to get some more seed to get out to our, our communities this, this next year. Um, I, I think also for the seed companies, for, um, for anyone, who may be listening here and thinking about this, if you're carrying a seed that came from an indigenous community, and if that community is not comfortable with you selling it, I would really encourage you to think about why they're not comfortable with it. And for anyone working for the seed companies or for customers even, I mean, you know, thinking about that, that, that's one of the issues with, with, with seeds. And I know we got a lot of plant breeders on, so I just wanted to, to mention to mention that. Um, but I think in terms of what am I excited about? I'm excited for for food sovereignty. I'm excited to see at Oneida that we've got more families that are growing and, and starting farmsteads and getting back onto the land and, and, and building up their seed banks and seed collections and supporting other growers in the community. And I see that across so many of, of, our, of our tribal communities that there's just more and more interest of, um, at that family, at that individual level of getting back into producing food and strengthening our relationships with the land. To me, that's what I get the most excited about. And that really is, is food sovereignty, um, is, is having more of that resilient agricultural system. And I, you know, I, I think that one of the, the impacts of this pandemic is that across the whole country, and, and I think probably, you know, even beyond, that there's more of, um, of interest in growing food again and, you know, raising food and harvesting. And I, 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 hope, for, I hope that in the long run that that, that continues. And I think that, uh, I think that there's a lot of great things to build off of. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dan. I know you have to hop on another call and do some teaching today, so um, we'll let you go. But um, I just want to, yeah, thank you again for your generosity and your the 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 spirit and the wisdom that you've shared today, and showing us all these beautiful varieties and um, the nixtamalization and sharing your wisdom about the movement and just where you see it going and helping to answer some questions. So. And, um, yeah, and if I could just say say one other thing, I mean, so for for people looking to support tribal producers, one place where you can go and uh, and find a directory of tribal producers is Intertribal Ag Council, our American Indian Foods Program. That website is IndianAgFoods.org, and we've got a producer directory on there. So for uh, for tribal food businesses that do have um, 
you know, retail and, and, and finished products, um, you can go and get a list of those there and support uh, support those producers through uh, through purchases, and then also have an opportunity to taste some of these foods for yourself. That's fabulous. I just posted it in the YouTube, so folks will have that link as well. Um, and I think uh, we'll. Um, your, you want to chat at me your email address, Dan, in case folks want to get in touch with you. And I can post it in yep. the YouTube. It's dan at indianag.org. Great. Excellent. Thank you again, Dan Cornelius of um, the Oneida Nation and Intertribal Agriculture Council. Um, not to mention, he also runs a uh, mobile farmer's market uh, in all his spare time. Um, just want to give you a big thanks again, Dan, for being with us today and uh, mention a few of the other folks who are going to be joining us um, in the coming days here. Uh, we're going to have uh, Spring Alaska, um, who's from uh, Sakurai Botanicals, joining us. Uh, sorry, Sakurai Farms, uh, who's going to be joining us uh, tomorrow. And um, they're going to be um, looking at G uh, Gite Okosumin uh, squash candy. And then we'll have Michelle Week um, from the Sinai Chikitsa Nation um, talking about the story of coyote and elk. Um, and she's with uh, Good Rain Farm. So uh, please uh, stay tuned and tune in tomorrow and the next day uh, for uh, Indigenous Foods Week as part of the Winter Vegetable Sagra on the Culinary Breeding Network's YouTube channel. You already know where to go. You're here. You're tuned in. And um, I think that's all we have for you today. Uh, Dan, you want to say any other parting words before we sign off here? Just thank you for um, for inviting me to, uh, to come. And... Uh... I don't hesitate. Anyone who's listening in, don't hesitate to get in contact if you want to talk more. Beautiful. Excellent. Have a beautiful day. Good luck teaching. And thank you again. Thanks, everybody, for thank tuning you. in. Take care.